Hello, and welcome to the second lecture of the Deep Learning course. My name is Peter Bloom, and today we're going to look at the backpropagation algorithm, the very heart of what makes uh, deep learning work. Today's lecture is divided into four videos. First, we'll start with a quick review of what neural networks are and um, how they, uh, the general principles behind training them. We sort of expect you to know these things already, but we'll review them quickly to set up our notation. Then we'll look into the backpropagation algorithm, uh, which we'll first do from a scalar perspective. So we'll look at individual uh, nodes in the network representing numbers. And then we'll lift that up to what we'll call tensor backpropagation, where we will describe the whole algorithm in terms of operations on matrices and vectors. And then finally, we'll look at automatic differentiation, how to put this into the computer in such a way that the computer does all the work for us. So let's start with the first part, a review of what neural networks are and how they work in general. Neural networks started in the 1950s when researchers had the idea that basically the brain is the only truly intelligent system we know. So let's see how the brain works and let's see if we can take some inspiration for that. This is one cell, one brain cell called a neuron. And the defining properties are basically that it has a lot of different inputs, which it, pro which it processes, and the signals that come from those inputs it processes and combines to create one output. And that output splits up and goes to uh, different other brain cells. So a very, very, very simplified version of this, uh, which is not a biologically plausible way of doing it, but uh, sort of the most simplified way you can think of a neuron most well, simplified version of a neuron you can put into a computer is what's called the perceptron. And it looks like this. Basically, we have uh, two inputs in this case, x1 and x2. And for every input, we have one weight, w1 and w2. And then there's also a, a separate input called a bias node, which we set fixed to 1. And that gets a weight called b in this picture. And the way we combine all these inputs is we multiply each uh, by their respective weight, and then we sum up the results. And that's all we do. And then the output is called y. So if you've done some statistics or machine learning, you will recognize this simply as a linear regression model. Uh, and that's the perceptron. And, and already with this uh, and a very uh, ad hoc learning algorithm, the perceptron could do some pretty interesting classification. But really what makes the brain powerful is not the power of a single neuron, but the fact that we can take a lot of these neurons and chain them together into a network. And that's really what we want to do here as well. The problem is, if you take this linear function, this perceptron, and you compose it with other linear functions, the result is always going to be also a linear function. Here's an example of that. On the left, we see three neurons chained together into a network. And below that, we see written out in full the function that they describe. The problem is, you can take these, uh, this formula, this formula down here at the bottom left, and you can multiply out the brackets, which gives you this function. And that function is also a perceptron. So basically, for any chain of perceptrons you set up, so long as they're all linear, they all sort of collapse back into one single perceptron. So what you need in order to, for the, um, uh, to achieve this, to, to, to get a, a network of perceptrons that can do more than any single perceptron can do, you need to introduce some nonlinearity. And a nonlinearity is very simple. It's just a function that you put uh, after the output of the perceptron. So you compute the perceptron as we did before. But afterwards, you take the single scalar output and you feed it to one scalar function, uh, which we indicate by a sigma. Here are two uh, relatively uh, common examples of nonlinearity. Uh, First, we see the sigmoid, which is this sort of S-shaped function uh, given by this formula here. And below that, we see the ray loop. Uh, we won't go into uh, why these are shaped the way they are or uh, why these are particularly useful yet. We'll look at that later. For now, just take it at face value that you need these nonlinearities in order to make the network work. And um, if we insert them, the network becomes more powerful than just a sequence of linear, uh, linear operations. So with these nonlinearities in place, what we can do is build a network. 
chain together these perceptrons, and the simplest way to do that is what's called a feed-forward network. Where we take a bunch of nodes, we arrange them in layers. The first one is the input layer, which are the, the input values that we feed to the network. The middle one is what we call the hidden layers. These are the um, values computed by the first set of perceptrons. And then we go to the output layer, which uh, is in this case one single perceptron that computes the output based on the values in the hidden layer. This is also called a multi-layer perceptron. And the important thing here is that nodes in a single layer are not connected to each other. They are only connected to nodes in the next layer. And every node in one layer is connected to every other node. Uh, sorry, every node in one layer is connected to every node in the next layer. And usually, uh, at least for a long time, the best we could do was uh, one or two hidden layers. Uh, so that's what we'll stick with for now. So we just go one hidden layer and then the output. And if we're doing regression, this is all we need. So we put some nonlinearities, in this case sigmoid nonlinearities, in the middle on the hidden layer. We put no uh, nonlinearity on the output layer, so that the output can range from minus infinity to positive infinity. And then we take the output as our model prediction in our regression task. And then we see how well it does. And then we try and tune the weights to make the uh, model prediction fit the data that we have, and we'll see how that's done later. If you have a classification task, specifically a binary classification task, you can achieve, uh, you can uh, build a model for this simply by putting a uh, sigmoid nonlinearity also on the output layer. So what this does is it takes this output of the model between minus infinity and positive infinity and it squeezes it into the range between zero and one. And we can then interpret this as a probability. So it's a binary classification task where we have two probabilities. So we interpret this output as the probability that the positive class is true. And then one minus that value must be the probability that the negative class is true. Which again gives us an, an uh, output, a probabilistic output for binary classification. If we have multi-class classification, what we can do is introduce a softmax nonlinearity, a softmax activation on the output layer. And that's a bit special in terms of activations because this is an activation that uh, doesn't lo just look at the value of one node, but it also looks at the values of other nodes in the same layer. The way it works, as you see here, you take the output values of the nodes, you exponentiate them, and then you normalize over all nodes in the output layer. And what this does is it gives you outputs that you can interpret as probabilities. So here we have our three output nodes, and we can note that the three output nodes, their values sum to one. That's always true if you apply this softmax nonlinearity to the output. So that's how you do multi-class uh, classification in a neural network. So now the question is, given some data, so we have some example inputs and we have some example outputs that, co should that uh, correspond to them, how do we find good weights? How do we train the neural network? And the basic principle is called gradient descent. So to explain gradient descent, imagine for a moment that you have a neural network with just two weights, w1 and w2. In this case, we can imagine the space of all possible weights that we could choose as a plane. So here we have a plane with w1 ranging in one direction, w2 ranging in the other direction, and every point in this plane is a possible neural network that we could choose. Now what we do is for a particular neural network, so we pick one point here, and for that particular neural network we compute what is known as a loss. And a loss is just a number that expresses how well the network does. The lower the loss, the better the network is, the more we like that particular network. And if we have, for instance, uh, some regression data, then we can define the loss as how close the model predictions are to the actual values that were uh, that we were given. Um, but in general terms, it doesn't matter. So long as we have some function that tells us how good the network is, we call that function the loss. And we just have to search this space of weights for a value, uh, for a model that has a low loss. So every point in this space is a loss. Some losses are lower than others. And we're looking for the minimum in this space. And this is, for instance, how the loss might be defined for a regression task. So here we see the model outputs y given the inputs x, and we have the 
in the data set we have uh, we also have a value t which tells us what the model should have said ideally and what we do here is we just look at this um, vector y and this vector t and we look at the distance between them and we take that as our loss so here we actually have a model with a vector output and a, a, a vector target value so one thing to note here before we move on that there are two functions in play one function is the model which is a function from the input to the output and one function is a loss which is a function from the model parameters to a scalar range so note that the loss is not a function of the model not a function of the input it's a function of the parameters of the model so that reduces everything we want to do in deep learning to this optimization problem we want to find the data where data is a kind of catch-all variable that just sort of captures all the parameters in the model and we want to find the variable theta for which this loss function is minimized and that's always the optimization objective that we want to solve one way or another uh, to give you an idea of what kind of loss functions are out there here are a couple so we've seen the squared error loss already which is just the Euclidean distance between the target output and what the model said uh, we can also have the we can also use the L1 norm it's basically not the squared error but the absolute error if we're doing classification and our model produces a probability then we can take the negative log probability of the correct answer and take that as our uh, loss which is the same for uh, uh, binary value uh, binary classification and multi-class classification but and these are derived from what is called uh, an entropy or a cross entropy uh, so this is what you ultimately end up with if you have integer target values but the actual entropy um, formulation is a little bit more complicated we won't go into that and then there's also hinge loss which looks like this and is derived from the um, maximum margin objective that you see in support vector machines I won't explain these any further, but uh, some of them we might uh, we might see later in the course and explain more deeply later in the course. But for now, here's just an example of the different loss functions you might uh, you might run into. And if we think of this parameter space, this 2D plane of all the parameters, we can think of the loss as forming a surface on top of that parameter space. Now, practically, we have a higher dimensional parameter space than just a plane. Uh, so it's difficult to visualize, but in general, the loss is always a scalar value, so that always forms a surface on top of our parameter space. And for this uh, this, this landscape, this loss uh, surface, we are trying to find the lowest point. So how do we do that? Uh, we basically use a uh, some principles, some very simple principles from calculus. As you may know, on a uh, function like this, so here we play, uh, plot it in 1D to start with. On a function like this, if our loss surface is something like this, like this uh, parabola here, uh, what we can do is compute the derivative. And the derivative is the slope of the tangent line at a particular point on the loss surface. And that tangent line performs a kind of, uh, is a kind of local approximation of the loss surface. And the slope of this derivative tells us how fast we are going up or down in a particular direction. If we apply this in multiple uh, dimensions, so if we do this in two dimensions, we get two derivatives, one along the parameter w1 uh, and one along the parameter w2. And these together, if we put both of these scalar values into a vector, we get a vector that points in a particular direction in our parameter space. And this vector is called the gradient, in this case, the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters. And that direction is the direction in which the loss increases the quickest. So if we take a direction in the opposite step to this, to the gradient, we will decrease the loss. And that's the basis behind the gradient descent algorithm. So that works like this. We start with some initial weights for the parameters. I'll look into that later, how to, how to set those, but for now just Think of them as maybe random weights. Uh, we go into a loop. We uh, loop over every uh, instance in our data. So we have an input x and a target output t. We compute the loss with respect uh, to that 
sorry, we compute the gradient of the loss defined with respect to that x and t, and we subtract that gradient multiplied by a, a value alpha from the current parameters. So that's basically taking a step in the opposite direction of the gradient. And that alpha is called the learning rate, and that ensures that we uh, can control how big of a step we take. Because remember, this gradient isn't uh, this gradient is based on a linear approximation to our loss surface. So the further we step away from the point where we are now, the worse of an approximation that's going to be. So we need to take small steps so we ensure that we stay roughly uh, that that approximation is roughly correct. Um, there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, what's drawn here is called stochastic gradient descent, where you look at one example at a time. Then there's a uh, mini batch gradient descent, where you look at a bunch of examples at a time and you sum their losses. And there's also a full batch gradient, where you look at the whole data set at a time. In deep learning, generally, we tend to use mini batch gradient descent. So we sort of to make a trade off between looking at just one example and looking at the whole data set. We look at somewhere between usually uh, 10 and 100 examples at a time for one gradient update. Uh, and just a bit of terminology, one pass through the whole data is called one epoch. And you train for a number of epochs, and then you're finished. And then you uh, will look later into what kind of conditions you uh, look at to decide whether or not you want to stop. So that's our basic recap of what neural networks are. And in the next video, we're going to look at the backpropagation algorithm, which tells us how to compute the gradient for a very deep and very complicated architecture, which is a non-trivial thing to do. So we'll discuss that in the next video.